it's that time. Let's go to work. I don't intend to be before you long, but I want to share a few things with you. Just two scriptures, one out of the Old Testament and one out of the New. Luke 135 and Isaiah 9, 6. Luke 135 and Isaiah 9, 6. I'm going to ask you to stand just for the reading of these two verses. Some of y'all ain't read since last Sunday. <laughs> it, it, what is amazing about Luke 135, we get to eavesdrop on a conversation between an angel and a, and a woman. And, and it is so powerful because the Holy Spirit, through the gospel writer of St. Luke, indulges us the luxury of being able to listen in at the divine talking to the human. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Amen. Go to my next verse. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. This morning I want to talk from the subject, Good Things Come in Small Packages. Good Things Come in Small Packages. Let's pray while we're standing. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you because you are a good thing. Hallelujah. Above everything else we may do or accomplish in life or get or receive or maybe it conferred upon us, you are the, the, the premier gift. And we honor you and we thank you and we adore you. Every other gift has come from you. Even if it came through someone. I thank you because you taught me years ago that you often love us through people. And sometimes we get so enthralled with the pipe that we don't thank God for the water. Bless us as we go into your word today and do an amazing thing in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good things come in small packages. Say that with me. It is odd to me the first time I read it that the angel would have a conversation with a virgin that was espoused to be married and that he would refer to Jesus as a holy thing. It, it almost offended my senses because if you call me a thing, when I'm a person, I would be offended. And yet the text says he is a holy thing. Which makes a question arise in my mind, why does the angel refer to him as a holy thing? Perhaps it is in part because nowhere in history has it been done before that the God of the universe would reduce himself down to his lowest common denominator, pour out of himself all glory and honor, and enwrap himself in humanity and become subject to something he created. He humbled himself. He is all the way God and yet all the way man. At one moment in the text, in the, throughout the text, they call him the son of God. And other times they call him the son of man. 
holy thing means he's nebulous. He's indescript. He will not be confined down to the limitations of our descriptions. He is a holy thing. A holy thing. This is not a carnal thing. This is not the consummation of a lustful act. This is a divine occurrence. The Holy Ghost shall come upon your flesh. Ghost and flesh produce God in human form. And you shall conceive. And that holy thing which is within you shall be called the Son of God. Absolutely amazing. The angels had never seen it. And yet the Bible says that the Lamb was slain from the foundations of the world. It was done in eternity before Adam. But you see, time is eternity's usher. It is through time that it reveals that which was already done. You think you got healed when it was manifest. But the Bible says that by his stripes, we were healed, past tense, already done. That means I was healed before I got sick. In another place, it says that he has determined the end from the beginning. You're waiting to see how things are going to work out in the end. He already knows how it's going to work out in the end because it's determined from the beginning. But you have to wait on time to usher in what he's already done. And then you jump up and start shouting and say, I got it. But you only got what you already had. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. You know, during the holidays when, you, when you're sitting with children, if you commemorate Christmas in that way, I'm not going to debate that with you, but if you're sitting up with children and you've got a bunch of gifts out there, it is natural for a child, almost extinct, instinctive of them, to open the biggest box first. We just cannot stand the curiosity of wondering what's in that box. And every time y'all leave out the room, the kids shake the box because they're trying to figure out what's in the box because we live in a society that suggests bigger is always better. But that's not always true. A bigger car is not always better than a smaller one. A bigger church is not always better than a smaller one. A bigger person is not always stronger than a smaller one. But because man looks on the outward appearance, we are caught up with the package. And if the package is big, we think it must be better. But it is not always better. Because many times good things come in small packages. I'm reminded of a story. Can I, this is a Christmas. Let me just give you a little Christmas story. I was told of a young girl who was born and raised blind. She got tired of hearing everybody talking about how blue the ocean was or how bright the sun was. How wonderful the sea waves looked crashing up against the rocks. And inevitably, rather than to adjust to her circumstances, she became increasingly bitter, antagonistic, resentful, frustrated. We do that whenever we feel like Everybody else got something we didn't. <laughs> Some of us are miserable, not because we're miserable, but we're miserable because we think other people got something better. 
I think it's that childlike nature that never dies inside of us, that competitive nature to think that the gift I have been given equates with my value rather than the giver that gave it. And so the Bible says that comparing yourself with one another, in so doing, it is not wise. And yet, if you have kids more than one, they do compare. You bought, you bought Johnny a bike. And sometimes I've wounded a lifetime because you bought me a tricycle. Never really thinking that my legs were too short to reach the bike. We compare ourselves with one another, not understanding that the gift is commensurate with our ability to manage what has been given. That's why the Bible rebukes us from being covetous because sometimes we crave what we couldn't handle. This girl was bitter because everybody else could see but her. A young man met her and he thought she was amazing. He thought she was beautiful. He, he, he thought she was beautiful inside and out. And he gave her something that we all need. He loved her. He loved her. And he was the only person to whom she was not antagonistic or resentful because even though she could not see him, she sensed that he loved her because love is something you sense. So all of you that are trying to pay for it, you, you can't buy it and all of you that only feel love when you are given you cannot count it love is sensed and not seen she sensed that he loved her and she said I love you too I love you so much that if I could see I would marry you if I could see I, I would marry you and just just don't think it's right for me to marry you like I am. But if I ever get where I could see, he said, you don't have to see for us to get married. I love you the way you are. She said, yeah, you're okay with it, but I'm not okay with it. If I could see, I would marry you. You're so amazing. You're so wonderful. You've been so kind. You have been the reason that I live. You are the air I breathe. You are the energy in my walk. You are the brightness in my spirit. And if I could ever see, I would marry you. And one day he came to her and he told her, he said, I just got a report from the doctors. They found a donor. And if we go right now, you could get a transplant and you could see. She said, are you serious? Oh my God, are you serious? You mean I could see? Really? Yes. So they prepped her for surgery and rolled her in the surgery and they did the transplant. And at first with the bandages and the swelling and the darkness, she still couldn't see. But as the bandages came off and the swelling went down, she opened up her eyes. And that that she had waited all her life to get had come. She could see. The lights in the room, the colors on the wall, the draperies on the window, she could see. And she was happy until she looked over at him and he was blind. And he said, I'm so happy for you. You got what you wanted, you can see. Will you marry me? And she said, absolutely not. 
You're blind. I'm not marrying you. And he was crushed. He was devastated. He had that feeling that all of us have had at one time or another of being rejected. Rejection doesn't ease up easily. But as he took his stick and he started to walk away, he turned and said to her, even if you don't want me, I hope you enjoy my gift. You see, he was not just her lover, he was her donor. And the only reason he was blind was so she could see. And I couldn't help but think about Jesus because <laughs> who had no sin became sin for me. He who never committed adultery and never mistreated anyone and never stole anything and never abused anybody loved me so much that he traded places with me and he went to the cross as if he had done wrong. And yet some of us say, oh no, I can't marry you. You're blind. And he says, I'm only this way because I loved you. Two little small things changed his life, changed her life, and changed his life. And he walked away blind so that she could see. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. You, you, you see, God is not really into big gifts. He's into little things. He, he, you see an apple seed, but God sees an orchard. Not just a tree, but the tree that produces more apples, that produces more seeds, that produces more trees, that produces more apples, are all in the one seed. So you toss the seed away because you're praying for orchards. Never really realizing that the orchard that you prayed for is in the apple seed. That the vineyard that you needed was in the grape you rejected. The Bible says the sustainability of all creation exists not in the power of the one who created it, but in the power of the seed he placed in creation. He only created one time, and after that, each thing producing seed after its own kind. God is a giver of small things, little packages. The Bible says that when we read in the book of Genesis that God created Adam, Adam is called Zira. He is God's seed, hence his son, because he is his seed. God is a God of seed. There will always be, Genesis 8, as long as the earth remaineth, seed time and Harvest. 
You shout about harvest and shy away from seed because you don't recognize that all that the harvest is is the outworking of the seed. This principle is so apparent that the writer of the Gospel of St. Luke has never met Isaiah. Isaiah is long since gone, and yet Luke records for us the power of a seed. The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and you shall, that which is within you is that holy thing. I'm trying not to be prophetic. You think the enemy is fighting you over your harvest? <laughs> Please. You know you ain't got that much harvest for the level of attack you've been up under. You know you ain't got that much harvest. You are not that important that you would have the kind of hell that has come against you in your life. So the enemy is not after your harvest. He's after your seed. Because he understands that all of nature, before there was a Bible, God is revealed through nature according to the scripture. All that God is, is revealed to us in seed. Be careful what you throw away. No, let's go deeper. Be careful who you throw away. <laughs> Be careful how you despise the day of small beginnings because good things come in small packages. It is important that we celebrate the birth of Christ, not just the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. It is important that we celebrate the birth of Christ because God is giving us a seed. A seed. Another zero. The last man, Adam. <laughs> the first and the last. <laughs> God is giving him to us. Isaiah enunciates in detail what the angel declares in obscurity. For Isaiah says it's this way, unto us a child is born. Let's process this in small bites. Doesn't say whether it's a male child, a female child, no attributes about the child, just that a child is born. Isaiah the eagle-eyed prophet is prophesying to an oppressed people that a child is born. They're thinking about the attacks they're going through with Assyria, looking for a Messiah. He's looking ahead. Sometimes God will speak to us about things that are beyond us. And while we are frustrated in this present moment, God may speak something to you that affects your child or your grandchild or your great-grandchild. So if you don't get it in the first generation, doesn't mean you're not going to get it. God is a generational God. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, you're going to start it. Isaac, you're going to pass it. Jacob, you're going to multiply it. But Abraham, you won't complete it. <laughs> but I tell you what I'll do. I'll start with a seed. I'll wait till your body is dead, and then I'll give you a seed. And you'll be able to pass through your body a seed that has a nation in it, and you won't get to see the nation. You will only see the seed in your lifetime. Your son will pass the seed. His son will multiply the seed and all of them will die before the seed becomes a nation. But whether it is incubated in the dead womb of Sarah or the dead atmosphere of the Egyptian slavery, I am a birthing God. 
I am a birthing God. I am always birthing you from dimension to dimension, from faith to faith, from glory to glory, from glory to glory. Unto us a child is born. That's what we came to celebrate. That's why all the neighbors and all the friends and all the company have come over to the house because a child is born. That's what we came to celebrate, the incarnation that God would become man. A child is born. But don't confuse the first phrase with the second one. Unto us a child is born, point two, and unto us a son is given. They're not talking about the same thing. A child is born, it speaks to his humanity and his birth, a son is given, not in the nativity, but the crucifixion. He gave Jesus to Mary through birth, but the son was given on Calvary. So Isaiah is speaking prophetically in phrases that we run in together and we think they're all talking about the same thing, but he's walking down through time. A child is born, a son is given. A child is born doesn't mean that he's a man when he's born, doesn't mean he's a husband when he's born, doesn't mean he's a leader when he's born, doesn't mean he's an overcomer when he's born, he's just a child. Isn't it amazing what God will put in a small package? You don't know, you mothers, you fathers that are holding babies in your arms, you have no idea who you're holding because you're looking at the seed, but God God is looking at the harvest and before it's over, sometimes you're an old man before you get to see and sometimes you never get to see who you really had. For unto us a child is born and a son is given and you think everything has to come through the first iteration of the gift. <laughs> but that's not necessarily true because this is not about you, boo. This is about what God is trying to do through you. So God doesn't have to answer all of your questions in your lifetime. Just do your job. Do what he told you to do. And don't worry about outcomes because outcomes don't always come out while you are looking. You may be in the ground, but God will still be accomplishing his word in the earth. And it may not come through your child. It may come through your grandchild or your great-grandchild. But if you didn't have the child, then they couldn't have the grandchild. Come on, talk to me somebody I'm talking to somebody right now unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given and then it, there's a hint of the Messiah the government shall be upon his shoulders and of his kingdom there shall be no end now wrapped in swaddling clothes laid in a manger those little shoulders don't seem like a shoulder that would be able to house the government upon his sh what shoulders you haven't seen them develop yet you're looking on the outside you're looking at the natural you're crying about the natural God is answering in the spiritual the government shall be upon his shoulders and of his kingdom there shall be no end. When Jesus was born, Herod suspected and had heard that he was more than Joseph's child and Mary's child or just a common child that he was a king. So he decreed, I got to kill him <laughs> because he's a threat to my throne. Some people try to kill you because you're a threat to their throne. And you say, what is it about little old me that you would put me on a hit list? 
while I'm still wrapped in milk rags. <laughs> laid in a manger. Me? I'm homeless. Jesus, look at the contrast. Born homeless. And then the next few verses we read, they're bringing frankincense and myrrh and gold. That's why the old folks used to say, he, he's so low you can't get under him and so high that you can't get over him. No matter how bad your story is, he can relate to you. If you don't have no place to stay, he said, I was born that way. I was born in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. I was born with absolutely nothing. Or if you're rich and successful, he said, let me tell you what they brought to my party. They brought gold and frankincense and myrrh because the contrast between the king and the kid is the breath of how far God can reach. He can reach you. I don't care how low you fall. He can reach you. I don't care how high you ascend. This is the Lord that we serve. This is the king of glory. This is the lamb of God. This is the mighty I am. And it's only a matter of time because God, God sends good things in small packages. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. A wonderful counselor. And I took the time to do a little research on the counselor thing because we're living in the time where everybody's talking about counselors, you know. So I wondered if, 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 if Jesus is telling me he's a therapist. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if I need to go lay on the couch and let him talk to my head. And, and, and that might be true, but that's not what the text is talking about. The same word that is translated counselor could also be translated advocate that I have a wonderful advocate. Let me break it down this way, that he's my attorney, that he pleads my case for me, that when I feel like I've been mishandled and mistreated, that I'm not without representation, I have counsel. They said, do you have counsel? Every judge wants to know, do you have counsel? And yes, you say, yes, I have counsel. I have a wonderful counselor. His name is Jesus. He pleaded your case when you were not in the court. He fought for you when you were not in the room. He defended you when Satan accused you. He stood up and cried out for mercy when justice was about to take you under. He was the one that was a wonderful counselor. And there are some people in this room that are celebrating, not because they've been good, but they had a wonderful counselor and he got you off and he dropped the charges and he took your place. Oh God, have mercy. He's a wonderful counselor. <laughs> I don't want the holy self-righteous never did anything people to give God a praise because it really hadn't sunk into you what I'm saying. I want the people who know you deserve to go to hell, who know you have done some wicked things, who know you have done some things you're ashamed of, and still God blesses you. I want you to praise the wonderful counselor. He pleaded your case. He got your case out of court. He delivered you. He justified you. Another judicial term. He justified you. Fix you up just as if you had never done what you did. And you're living in, driving in, walking in, washing dishes in the grace of God. How dare you say God doesn't love you? How dare you think that God doesn't care about you? You got a wonderful counselor. You should have been diseased. You should have been dead. You should have been in a jail cell sell. Who knows what would have happened to you but now, by now. But the wonderful counselor dropped the charges and there you are crying about a bump on your finger when you ought to be shouting that you can see, that you can move, that you can live, that you can have your being. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody today who's stepping over small things, complaining about things that are big to you, but God is not in the big stuff. He's in the small stuff. I want somebody to praise him for that little thing he did. That little door he opened. That little way he made. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> no, no. I want the kind of crazy praise that doesn't make sense. 
The, the people who are praising God because you got your hair done. The people who are praising God because you got your nails done. Because you used to couldn't afford to get your hair done. The people who are praising God because you got a car. The people who are praising God because you can breathe. The people that are praising God because you can stand up and your back don't hurt. The people that are praising God because you can move. The people that are praising God because you can digest your food. Sitting on the toilet saying, thank you, Jesus. I want somebody who can praise God. God for some stuff you can't testify about. But when you think of the goodness, when you think of the goodness, when you think of the goodness, when you think of the goodness of Jesus, it's not always in your garage. It's not always in your house payment. It's not always in your investment. Sometimes the goodness of God is in being able to suck air, being able to move, your heart being regulated, your pulse being regulated. That's what you got for Christmas. You got another day. You got another week. You got another month. Somebody take 30 seconds and praise him for what you got for Chris. Praise him for what he did in your life. Praise him for the doors he opened. Praise him for the way he made. It don't make sense to nobody else but praise him. I want some folks that are praising because you went to the beautician because your mama used to do your hair. Praise him because you went to the barbershop because your mama used to put a little bowl on your head and cut your hair and you're thankful about stuff that you can't even explain to other people because until you've been through what I've been through, you don't understand what my praise is about. So I guess I'll just walk off and go on about my business, but I was good to you when you couldn't even see that I was good. I was there for you when you couldn't even see that I was there. I was there for you when you were in your iniquity, in your sins, in your pit. Somebody take the last 10 seconds and praise him like you lost your mind. I feel something about to break in this place. I feel something about to break loose in this place. I feel like the Holy Ghost is about to come upon you, about to come upon your barrenness, come upon your emptiness, come upon your situation, and God is going to do something for you. It's going to look small at first, but the Holy Ghost said don't throw it away because through that small door, that person you met and didn't pay no attention to, through that small conversation that you had over a cup of coffee at Starbucks, God said, a whole new dimension is about to emerge in your life through little things because good things come in small packages. Look at somebody say it's small but it's big. It's small but it's big. You might not understand it but it's small but it's big. And when God gets through blessing me, you're going to be surprised. You walked over me because you thought I was small. But when God gets through blessing me, you're going to begin to understand that the stone that the builders re I hope you enjoy my gifts as I hasten to a close the text reaches far and wide when it says, unto us a child is born. And then he says that he is the mighty God. Wait, wait, I thought we was talking about a child. And yet in the same paragraph, you have reached from a child is born, a nameless 
child, a nebulous child, a holy thing, a little itty bitty baby, somebody that killed poops on herself and pees on herself and nursing off your breast and now you call him God and now I realize uh, that he's child enough uh, to drink the milk uh, from a breast that he's God enough to have created, uh, that he is man enough uh, to get cold and need to be wrapped up uh, and God enough uh, to create the blanket that wrapped him up in, that he's child enough uh, to die on a cross, but God enough to raise the tree that he knew would be the cross. I'm talking about the paradoxical God who is both child and God, Lord and Christ, he which is and was and is. Oh, let me, let me. Stop somebody and say he's God. He's God. He's God over your trouble. He's God over your crisis. He's God over this country. He's God over this generation. He's God over your country. He's God over your country. And yet he's God over your family. He's God enough to run eight billion people. And yet he's sensitive enough to hear the cry of one. He's God. He's God over cancer. He's God over leukemia. He's God over high blood pressure. He's God over diabetes. He's God over lameness. He's God over dementia. He's God over arthritis. He's God over autism. He's God. The child. The child that's born is the mighty God. Now, God, the mighty God, means he's the ruler. He's in charge. He's the boss. He's the CEO. He's the ancient of days. He is the I am of Israel. <laughs> Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. He's my shield and my blocker. <laughs> he's my way maker and my bridge over troubled waters. He's my joy and my peace. He's my lily in the valley. He's my bright and morning star. He's my doctor and my lawyer. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. He's woman enough to be the breasted one, and yet he's man enough to be our heavenly father. Everything he needs, he has within himself. He is complete within himself, lacking nothing. Thing. He didn't even need Mary to create Jesus because he made his first son by himself, but he brought her in on the birthing process and partnered with a woman. He said, I did the first one by myself. I'm going to do the second one with you like I did with Moses. I hewed out the stone and I wrote in it by myself, but the second one I said, if you hew it out, I'm going to write on it because I'm going to partner with you. As you get ready to go into 2023, God said, I'm going to partner with you. I'm going to partner with you. If you do your part, I'll do my part. Faith without works is dead. I'm glad you believe me, but you're going to have to work that thing. Slap somebody and say, work that thing. He's God. Somebody holler, he's God. Heaven is his throne. Earth is his footstool. He's God. Before there was a where or a when or this or that, he's God. Somebody shout, he's God. Before the stars begin to twinkle, he's God. Before the clouds begin to slide, he was God. Before H2O was ever analyzed, he was still God. Before gravity had a name, he was God. Before earth was a planet, he was God. Before the sun began to burn, he was God. That's why Moses couldn't find the beginning. He could find the beginning of the earth, but he couldn't find the beginning of God. So he said, in the beginning, God, ancient of days, 
David said, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Somebody take a minute and praise God. God over your problem. God over your situation. God over your crisis. God over your circumstances. God over your dilemma. God over your happiness. God over your situation. God over your needs. He's God. I bow before him. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. He is God. The mighty God. The God that can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we may ask or think. Touch three people and say he's mighty. Demons tremble when you say it. He's mighty, mighty, mightier than any demon, mightier than any legion, mightier than any disease. He's a mighty God. But that's, that's not the most amazing part because he would be God if I were not his and he was not mine. He would still be God. So then they came along and sealed it and called him the everlasting father. That's when it got personal. That's when it established that he is the everlasting father. Wait a minute. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That means the same guy who played son. <laughs> played father. <laughs> Don't be amazed. <laughs> Don't be amazed. You, you've seen Tyler Perry do it. You've seen Eddie Murphy do it. The, the, the same one who played this, played that. God is a play actor. He played son and father and Holy Ghost. This is the mystery of the Godhead. Let me stop. This is why we'll never figure it out because it's the same power playing all three roles. You say he's a trinity and yet he says he's one God and we argue back and forth and ain't neither one of us wrong because you can have one God that can do three things because he's God all by himself. He didn't have to hide nobody to play the other part. He is the son. Let me stop. And the father. Abba. He's mine. In the calm stillness of the night, with shepherds grazing in the field, and sheep all gathered around. Shh. He was born in that. So he is the prince of stillness. Let me say it like the Bible says it. He is the prince of peace. So what if he gave me a car and I don't have no peace? So what if I get a 10 bedroom house and I can't sleep in it? So what if I make a hundred million dollars a year and everything I eat, I throw up? He is the prince of peace. When I was young and I got saved, I grew up in the Baptist church. I got spirit filled in the storefront church. And when I got in the storefront church, everybody was dancing. 
We don't dance now. You know what I'm talking about. They was dancing. See, y'all don't, y'all don't know what it is. See somebody dancing on the back of a pew. And, and I was so amazed at them dancing all over the church. And when church was out, they carry them out, they still be dancing. And they have to hold their head when they put them in the car with no music, <laughs> with no music, with no drums. They still be dancing, because they heard the music. That's why they said, over my head, I hear music in the air. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. And sometimes service would go on till midnight, and it didn't get right till the clock struck 12. And at midnight, Somebody would grab the mic and say at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and the shout would break out again. Sometime we was getting out when the club was closing and they was drunk off of Boone's farm. Well, we was drunk off the Holy Ghost and you couldn't tell who was the most drunk because they were staggering and we were staggering. I'm talking about the power. Somebody in here knows a little something about the power power of God, the power of God. So when I was young, I said, Lord, I want that joy. Give me that joy, that unspeakable joy, that joy that can dance through heartache, that can dance through trouble, that can dance through tests. Give me that kind of joy that can make me dance around a pot-bellied stove and not get burned. Give me that kind of joy that can dance on the backs of pews and never lose my balance. Give me that kind of joy. And I say, they, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. Give me that joy. I want that joy. But when I got older, I said, Lord, I thank you for the joy. But if I'm going to survive, Give me that peace. Give me that peace. The kind of peace that my head isn't spinning when I lay on my pillow. Give me that peace that I can walk through folk talking about me and not have any concern at all about what they think. Give me that peace so that when I face a storm, I can face it and have the storm on the outside and not have the storm on the inside. So yesterday, as I closed yesterday, my pipes froze. And they burst. And my wife came and got me and it was raining in the kitchen, flooding. And we were trying to keep it from getting all through the house. And so we got a ladder. I climbed up in the, on the ladder. My son and my daughter-in-law came over and they was running squeegees and mops and throwing down towels and the water still flooding in. I walked up on the ladder and the cold water, frigid water was pouring down on me. Uh-huh. And I had gone from cooking to being doused in cold water. When I got a minute, I texted my sister and I told her, turn your water on because my pipes just froze. Because I'm still trying to protect everybody from going through what I'm going through. My sister was worried. She kept calling me. Are you okay? I said, I'm fine. Kitchen is flooded. My clothes are wet. It flooded so bad it set off the alarm system. The alarm system wouldn't shut off because a short got in it. So every five minutes, the alarm was going off. And they were calling the house thinking there was a breach in security. So I'm answering the phone, running back in the room. And the enemy said, I'm going to ruin your holiday. 
And you know what I said? No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're not. The very fact that I know you want to do it, that's the very fact I'm not going to let you do it. Because in order for you to ruin my holiday, I have to surrender my peace. Now, I can't control the pipe, but I can control the... Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. So after a while, the fellas came in, they took over, and, and, and we found, we cut the water off, we found where the leak was. They went to the store and we fixed that leak, and then they said, we got another leak. I said, okay. I said, does it stop the water from coming into this part of the kitchen? They said, no. I said, good. I'm going to keep cooking. <laughs> so while I'm preaching here, I got water in some places <laughs> and dryness in other places. But that don't matter because you can mess with my water but you can't mess with my peace. Because somewhere down inside, I have peace. To all of you, to all of you who are in a position right now that maybe you didn't get what you wanted or people didn't do what you wanted them to do or you went through some loss or some grief or some pain or some trouble or you're watching online and you don't have the TV Christmases which are produced <laughs> with actors and you think that their life is better than yours and you're a little bit ticked with God because you don't have what you see on TV? He have borne your griefs and carried your sorrows and gave all that he had that you might see and now you got eyes and still can't see? You see, you thought when the girl got surgery that now she could see. And you felt sorry for the man because now he was blind. But he had more sight in his blindness than she had sight with her eyes. To every one of you that are in this room that cannot see what he gave you, you can't see that he loved you. You can't see that he stood by you when everybody turned against you. And you can't see that if it were not for his goodness, you wouldn't be alive. And now you thinking about getting saved? What is there to think about? Your next breath you can't catch it if he don't give it to you. And if you can't see that, then you can't see that good things come in small Packages. This is not about trees, or decorations, or lights, or gifts, 
or cooking or food or friends or family, functional or dysfunctional, this day is about the ultimate gift. And you can't see it because good things come in small packages. You mad at your mama and not glad you had a mama. Not a perfect mama, not a great, but, but you, you, you had a mama. You were angry at your father. But if you didn't have one, you wouldn't be here to be angry. You angry at your children? But if the phone rang and said they was dead, whatever you fussing about would seem silly. Good things. The best things in life are the small things. You fall in love with somebody, not for the big things. It's the little things. It's the twinkle in your eyes. It's the way you lay your head on my breast. It's, it's the way you keep checking on me and calling on me. It's the way you ran to my rescue when you thought I was hurting. It's not always the big flashy stuff. Good things come in small packages. And every good thing you got, if you don't appreciate it, and you belittle it and make it small, you will always lose it because you don't see the value of small things.